Nothing to see here. That's still the message from Britain's right-wingers as the Earth experiences its hottest temperatures on record. And some of these right-wingers are combining their summer holidays with some frontline reporting. Talk TV's Julia Hartley Brewer posted this video shot from her car. Now, captioning the clip, Hartley Brewer wrote, Here in Sicily, the wildfires have been tragic for the free who died and a pain for holidaymakers evacuated. But despite the UK media hysteria, Sicilians are taking the fires in their stride because they're used to them. Our drive past Catania yesterday. The wildfires are a part and parcel of summers for Sicily. Yes, 40 degrees temperatures for two weeks due to the Saharan heat wave have made the ground drier, but high winds and high temps plus poor land management inevitably lead to sporadic fires. The world is not on fire. Now, Julia's frontline reporting from her car might have given her the impression these fires are normal for Italians. I'm not really sure what she inferred that from, that other people were also driving down the road. Um, in any case, however, the country's civil protection minister disagrees. He wrote this on Facebook. We are experiencing in Italy one of the most complicated days in recent decades. Rainstorms, tornadoes and giant hail in the north, and scorching heat and devastating fires in the centre and south. The climate upheaval that has hit our country demands of us all a change of attitude. Um, now, that is not a message saying business as usual. He's saying we need a change of attitude because climate change is, is radically changing the challenges we are facing. Now, it's worth noting, Musumeci is, is not a bleeding heart liberal. Right, this is not the kind of person that Julie Hunter was like, oh, of course he's going on about climate change, just some lefty lovey. No, um, he's presumably a very bad guy because he is a member um, of the Brothers of Italy, so Maloney's hard right party. Um, not, a, not a left-wing guy, presumably not a particularly nice guy. Julia also had her say on the wildfires in Greece. So she said this. There are forest fires in Greece every year, and the Greek police say these fires appear to be the result of arson. But yeah, you're the experts, Extinction Rebellion. Um, and she is, as you can see, um, this is aimed at Extinction Rebellion, who had been tweeting about climate change and sort of disagreeing with Julia Hartley Brewer, claiming it was just summer. Um, firefighters in Greece have suggested there are indications the wildfires were started by arsonists. But in using that as an argument against Extinction Rebellion, Hartley Brewer misses a key fact. No one has ever claimed that climate change starts fires, right? Arsonists might start fire. It might be, you know, accidents might start fire. What climate change does, though, is means they will spread further and faster than ever before. Now, this is an astute quote from Professor Stefan Durr. He is director of the Center for Wildlife Research at Swansea University. So he says this, any ignition can rapidly turn into a fast-moving wildfire. That could be faulty power lines, small intentional fires to burn debris getting out of control, sparks removing machinery or building activity or arson. Focusing mainly on ignition sources distracts from the main issues, which are more flammable landscapes due to insufficient management of vegetation and more extreme weather due to climate change. So Europe is suffering from more wildfires than usual, and the extent of those wildfires is largely due to climate change. So what will the right-wingers have up their sleeves next? Well, they do have something. We're told that, in fact, record-breaking heat waves aren't all that bad. I've got to say, uh, this whole heat wave, I was in Spain uh, very briefly last week, and yeah, it was quite warm, but I, you know, I don't mean to be funny, but that's what you go to Europe for. You want it to be quite hot, don't you? Or maybe I am missing something. She probably is missing something. Now, that was Michelle Chubry on GB News, a disclaimer I go on her show um, fairly often. She's very personable in person. But everyone on that channel has an obsession with downplaying climate change. To respond concretely to her point on the holiday issue, I think most people can agree there's a difference between 30 degree temperatures by the beach, which might be quite nice, and 45 degree temperatures somewhere inland, right? Even 45 degree temperatures on the beach are not going to be pleasant, right? You, you don't want to be somewhere that is that hot. You want it to be hotter than here, but not that hot. Um, and it is those temperatures such as 45 degrees, the late 40s, which are what parts of Europe have contended with this week. Now, we should also remember, and this is probably more important, that the Mediterranean heat waves haven't just affected Europe. In Tunisia, temperatures have reached 49 degrees Celsius. And in neighboring Algeria, 34 people have been killed in wildfires so far. This report from the BBC showed how Algerians are responding to those wildfires. Flames licking at the treetops. A wall of fire quickly swells. It's a devastating scene. Villagers on the front line, armed only with branches and shovels. 
We have been fighting this fire for five days. There is no electricity, no water, no gas, no network. There is nothing here. We are tired. On the tarmac at Algiers airport, a lifeline. Two water bombing planes chartered by the Algerian government from the EU, with another two arriving from France. But for those already firmly in the grip of this battle, government support seems non-existent. The people of Algeria are alone. We have received nothing from the government except threats. People are acting together as one, and we have received aid from everywhere. Now, of course, according to Julie Hartley Brill, we should just keep calm and carry on. Fires happen. You know, whatever. The global consequences of these heat waves are going to make that pretty difficult, though, wherever you are. Consequences like this one posted by climate journalist Patrick Gailey. So he says, Jesus Christ, Southern Europe grain yields are likely to be 60% lower than last year and 9.5% lower than the five-year average due to heat waves. The global food system will shatter how all systems do gradually and then all at once. Um, I think that's a really important point. Um, I think things you need to do when sort of discussing climate is is talk about how you know the, the people at the real sharp end of this aren't going to be in countries like the UK. They're going to be in places such as Algeria, places which are already quite hot and also don't have the resources to deal with the effects of climate change in the same way that richer countries in the global north will. Also, though, that even if you don't necessarily see all of the effects of, of climate change sort of very clearly in front of your eyes, you're still going to feel them. And you can feel them, I mean, in, in this example, by increased food production costs, right? Because if you're getting droughts, then that is going to affect the amount of grain you can produce and that is going to increase the price of food. Now, as James Meadway always says, we have him on the show, he's always incredibly articulate. Um, he, he suggests, you know, this dichotomy that politicians always make between inflation as a priority and climate action as a priority is a false one because one of the reasons why prices will continue to rise is because climate change makes the production of all sorts of things harder. Now, that's in part because, you know, you will get droughts and hot weather. It's also just because things become much less predictable. We know that extreme weather becomes more likely in climate change. So that means that even if we say, oh, okay, well, Northern Europe's hotter now, so that actually makes it easier to plant certain things. It might be harder to grow stuff in Italy, but it might be easier to grow stuff in Germany. Maybe in Italy, they can just plant different crops. There are things you can do to try and I suppose, adapt to changing climates. What is very, very difficult to adapt to, or at least to adapt to without incurring huge costs in the process, is just extreme weather that's very difficult to predict. So there, there is no way by which climate change at the scale we're already seeing is not going to affect us all. Mike, what have you made of this? Now, uh, when when climate change was discussed for a long time, you know, right-wingers would try and sort of say, oh, this is just bunk, you know, they, we're going to critique your models, et cetera, et cetera. Now we are seeing it, right? So earlier this month, there was a week whereby one day was the hottest day ever on average. That record was broken on the Tuesday and that record was broken again on the Thursday, right? And I don't think temperatures have fallen below that record breaking or fallen below the previous record since then. See, these, these are average global temperatures. Now it's very, you know, the facts are in front of people's eyes and still you're saying, oh, this is, this is catastrophizing. We, we need to have some perspective. We need to calm down. I mean, what do you make of it? I think the kind of modern right and how they want to deal with the climate crisis is to minimize it and frame it as a liberal confection. So these liberals getting upset about just a bit of hot weather. I mean, who doesn't like sun in Spain, right? I think the problem is that presenting the abnormal as normal is, is undermining the kind of fight for climate justice. And, and I think this is a real threat that, you know, we on the left and people who care about the climate really need to deal with. The fact that there are going to be these dissenting voices. It wouldn't surprise me if someone like Nigel Farage, for example, entered this and became more vocal, critical of, you know, the fight for climate justice. But these dissenting voices who want to undermine the fight for climate justice and present it as some liberal confection, all of us getting upset over nothing. That's a real threat. And We've already seen both major parties dilute their you know, policies when it comes to climate justice. So Labour and this whole ULES fiasco, you know, following the the rice slip and, and the Oxbridge and rice slip um, by election, you know, that's not a good thing. And we we can't let the right, you know, and this idea that, you know, some members of the electricians are going to be upset by our climate policy. We can't let these things stop us from this really pressing issue. This is an issue that is ultimately a matter of life and death, for, you know. As you mentioned, people in the global south can be affected the most by this. 
eventually we're going to be affected in ways that are going to be when we, event, we already are being affected in ways, but it's, it's going to get worse and worse for all of us. So we all, all of us across the world, there's real need for a collective effort to fight climate change. And I feel like these dissenting voices, the Julie Hartley Brews of this world, the GB News gang, all of these people who want to minimize and play down the, the kind of climate crisis, they really risk, you know, this real important fights that we have on our hands as, as, a, as an entire planet. The entire planet is going to be engaged, needs to be engaged rather, in this fight for climate justice and this fight for a greener, more sustainable planet. I think mean, the real danger will be if that sort of politics infects the top of the Conservative Party. Now, obviously, we've got all sorts of critiques of the Conservative Party, and especially when it comes to green things, um, Sunak, pretty appalling, right? So uh, we've seen all these sorts of very high-profile people complain about Sunak not taking climate seriously. They're obviously responding to these heat waves by sort of suggesting they're going to drop climate pledges here, there, and everywhere. What we still do have, though, is consensus across the main parties, and to be honest, across most of the establishment, that... And, and the public, in fact, um, that climate change is real, it's happening, it's very significant, it's very important. There's big consensus around things such as net zero, there's disagreement about how to get there. Um, some of that is honest disagreement, some of that is a disagreement which is based on defending vested interests of corporate power. Um, it's difficult sometimes to arbitrate between the two, but both of those things are going on. What we don't have, though, is a establishment force, really, which is just trying to you know, just throw shit at the whole conversation by saying, is it really climate change? Is it really a problem? Da, 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 da. Now, obviously in America, they've got that because the Republican Party is full of people saying that and Fox News backs it up and there's sort of this, 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 this positive feedback loop between the two, which just gets more and more extreme. And it means that very, very difficult to make any kind of long-term policy here. Hopefully, and um, we can avoid that. But I think it's very likely that if Labour win the next election and Tories go into opposition, they will end up with a leader that, you know, at the very least flirts with climate scepticism. And if that's the case, obviously opposition parties get a lot of time in the news. You could have a much more sort of dangerous feedback between the Conservative Party and outlets like GB News when it comes to sowing climate doubt. Mm -hmm.